I blame the Romans. How unfortunate that the word for left side has evolved into the word for evil. <laughs> Language evolves in sinister ways. My name is Nat Aberdeen. I am the writer equivalent of a drop of water in a vat of fruit punch. I spent most of my life hiding away in a secluded corner, hiding away in a secluded room, hiding away in a secluded building, hiding away in a secluded island. I was surrounded by people I hated who would constantly bicker and fight with metal tools, fire, electricity, and telepathic trauma. I didn't instigate anything, I just stayed sitting there, but... I guess when you're a fly on the wall, people instinctively treat you as just another annoyance to get rid of. Tomorrow marks the 20 something anniversary of a series of exposés I wrote called Sinister Recluse. I'm celebrating how I normally celebrate anniversaries, by treating it as any other day but with a looming feeling of dread in the back of my head. Any insane-minded person who has read my exposés knows the risks and the dangers they have brought. My exposé on Frank Trout led to the fiery death and destruction of many people and buildings. The one on Grayson Smith ended in temporary blindness and a hole in my shirt. And even worse, the one on Mark Twain involved me having to read The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Yet none of them compare any more to my exposé on Plainwood, the first, and please God only, sinister recluse story that I have ever had the mispleasure of living firsthand. It's funny how I now look back on everything that happened in Plainwood and chuckle in smug relief. At the time, I was clinging to my life, praying I would make it out in one piece. But now I can only see it as just another pleasant night on the couch with a plate of chicken cordon bleu on my lap. The sad yet noble caveat is that every delicious plate of chicken cordon bleu needs a little bit of adversity to achieve success. And living in Plainwood was like the arduous process of preparing such a delicate complex dish tenfold. There were devastating accidents and messes caused by all sorts of well-meaning people. There were people hiding their delightful inside with a thin and unstable outside. There was an unsavory amount of French. And worst of all, there were dirty hands. Despite it all, Plainwood is my home. Would I trade it for the world? Yes. Maybe not for this world, but I would definitely trade it for a world where your mere existence doesn't cause a tan-wide panic. Maybe for a world where people aren't speaking French all the time. Definitely for a world where people's own wrong opinions don't distort the surface level reality. But I would not trade it for this world for the life of me. For all intents and purposes, I cordially welcome you all to Plainwood. We're all spiraling out of control here. That's how we like it. Everyone in Plainwood had a scarring memory of October 31st, the day Murray and Marley attacked. Many people described it as the biggest possession scandal in Plainwood, even more so than the White Demon, where the leader of a marching band grew inexplicably blind and led all of the other marching band members off of a cliff. In hindsight, perhaps having a marching band comprised entirely of lemmings may not have been a worthy use of Plainwoodian tax dollars. Marley, on the other hand, was not a planner like the White Demon. He simply had an uncontrollable drive that eventually led him to Riverside Road. He didn't know what drove him, besides the alluring scent of bananas on the other side of the street, but once he finally laid eyes on that statue of the left hand, and the house that it sat on, all hell broke loose. Now, thanks to that hideous encounter on Riverside Road that fateful 31st of October, nobody can say the name Marion Marley anymore without screaming for their lives and running away flailing and diving into a bush. Not like Marley cared, though, he just kept on frolicking through his demonic field of flowers, taking control of the spirit of any innocent bystander he could get his grubby little gloves on. The 30 seconds I had first met Marley, he seemed like a stand-up guy. He did a puppet show for me, taught me a few ASL signs, and even gave me an origami folding of myself with the head removed and had a Your Next written on it in any very lovely font. The second I turned my back, though, Marley slithered up to my shoulder and whispered uncomfortable troops into my ear. He took his left hand, removed his glove, and then clutched it onto the nape of my neck like a wine glass. Had it not been for my uncanny ability to avoid human people, which I've been honing since I was a kid, I would not have made it out alive. My second biggest takeaway from this, the first being never interact with people, obviously, was that if you do interact with people, never trust your first judgment. Although, a worthy contender for a third biggest takeaway would be to steer clear of hands. I am proud and terrified to say that I have no idea what became of Marley since then, but I can confidently guarantee you he is not doing puppet shows in origami anymore. 
But even then, I can still picture the puppets decaying and the foldings unraveling. Despite the weathering of time, their creases remain. And now, whatever unsuspecting township Marley has gotten his hands on, a permanent fingerprint stains its history. Fingerprint's only purpose is to stain, after all. The sensible ones washed their hands of the affair, the whole ordeal gradually fading from memory as everybody carried on with their lives. And then there is Plainwood. Something about Plainwood gave the opposite effect. Usually, if you were lucky enough to have an encounter with Marley, you would want to run around and start your new life as a vagabond blues traveler. But when Marley crashed and burned Plainwood, all it did was hook in more people, demons, and spirits to come and stand and look around. And when you're in the middle of the mountains on an island on the very edge of what constitutes as somewhere, you don't tend to get visitors who are just passing through. Don't get me wrong, we love tourists and have at most three attractions, but we've learned from experience, hideous encounter after hideous encounter, that the only ones who really cared about coming to Plainwood were the ones with burning ulterior motives. A young woman with high resolve and low endurance flared through a spider web. The falling rocks below made her lose her balance, the cackling birds above made her lose her confidence. How and why she got there she had suppressed from her memory, but she kept trekking onwards with a sense of foolish courage. Still, foolish or brave, it takes massive amounts of courage to escape your comfort zone, and even more massive amounts to escape your discomfort zone. She had been traipsing through the wood for god knows how long and was just on the brink of collapsing. She rested on the base of a tree stump next to a fresh still pond. In all her naivete, she dared to take a quick glimpse into the water. All scribbly jumbles of thought bouncing around her skull eventually flattened, thanks to the peaceful swish of the wind and the jarring allure of that stranger on the other side of the pond. Was that really the same person who had escaped numerous verifiably uncomfortable people to be around? Who had little to no people who didn't want to wish her death by scorn or Mark Twain? and who had to wander all the way through the Monolayan Mountains just to get off the grid. Wow, she looks so sweet and innocent. I wish I could be safe and secure like her. <sighs> Natalie Oriole? Never heard of her. Icy winds breeze through the holes of her torn, thinning gloves, tickling her exposed scars on her palms. How she got through a snowy mountain with nothing but sweats is beyond me, but I like to believe the burning motivation to finally get on Riverside Road once and for all was enough to stave off the hypothermia. Plus, with how much the folks back home feared and ignored her, Natalie had gotten used to her blood running cold every now and then. Her heart beat rapidly as she took out her phone, the newest model of Texty Talk Mobile. She remembered the slogan the first time she got it. Signal reaches anywhere. No service. Perfect. A gnarled tree next to her crumbled, collapsed, and decayed into the ground, but she wasn't going to let herself do the same. Especially considering everything else, and everyone else, she had to trudge through and escape to get here. Her heart skipped a beat when the ground turned from a fluffy white to a deep, dark green. At last, there it was, the first sign of civilization! If you made it this far and know what's good for you, welcome to Plainwood. Gloves required. This vacant hidden director brought to you by Science of Civilization LDD. The grass grew greener and more trimmed. Pleasant shady fog and paper-thin sheet of snow coated the ground. Wooden buildings sprung up from the floor like trees in a forest. It looked less like a town and more like a homey settlement of stranded explorers, which, incidentally, was how Plainwood was founded in the first place. There was a certain serenity in the lack of anyone around, but after a while the abandonment felt more eerie than anything. Stone benches that were donated by people who used to be alive, fountains that used to have water in it, flag on a pole that used to be free of rips and tears. In the center of the road, there was a circular town square, a town squarkle, if you will, where the only comforting symbol for Natalie was an old, rotting, decrepit house with a hideous statue of a left hand on the roof. The statue imposed itself, brooding over Natalie like a perched raptor. No one knew exactly what it meant or who erected it, but they knew it depicted a bare left hand, which was all they needed to fuel their aversion. The scary statue of the sinister symbol stood there as a constant omen of the future, as well as an unhealing scar of the past. For Natalie, though, all it meant was she was in the right place. Freaking finally! Oh, I'd high-five you if I could, Mr. Statue. Mm-hmm, <laughs> yep. 249 Riverside. Wonderful. 
She trudged around to the backyard and sighed with a smile. It wasn't much to look at, but when all you've been looking at for the past god knows how long were tree stumps, snow, spider webs, and the ungodly life choices that have brought you up to this point, a wooden deck and a leaf-covered hot tub suddenly seemed like high-class luxury. God, why do people lock their doors? Start trusting people for crying out loud. Oh yeah, Nut, we'll teach you the important stuff like how to talk to people or how to spell your name, but not how to pick a freaking lock? <sighs> Let's see, anything under the mat? Hairpin? No. Paperclip? No, sheet of metal in the shape of a key. I'll oh, screw it. I'll do this the easy way. Natalie reached into her pocket and grabbed a black rock she had been guarding with her life since birth. As soon as it began to glow a faint red, she chucked it and... She shattered the door open and stuck into the shadows, sticking closely to the walls. <sighs> I can't believe it. I'm here. How did this even happen? Am I that good or what? <sighs> no worries, Nat. It's your imagination. You've been hearing background sounds in the mountains constantly. It's just some residual ringing. No big deal. Easy for her to say, though, the one thing she trusted less than other people was herself. Nothing about the inordinate amount of junk on the floor struck her as odd, since the last thing she wanted to do in her excited fatigue was think and reason. Ew! My... God, I stepped on a wet sock! The hell? Oh crap on a stick. Is this the wrong place? The woman on the other end of the house crept closer and closer little by little and looked Natalie dead in her disheveled, debris-covered face. The woman said nothing, but merely cocked her head and put her hands on her hips, awaiting a response. Natalie opened her mouth in an attempt to explain herself, but the fear paralyzed her, her face morphing into an expression only describable with the popular colloquial phrase, Oh no! A person! I was not expecting this! I have erred and made a fatal blunder! Without saying a word, she clutched her tingling hands over her rushing heart and closed her eyes tight, enveloping herself in a blinding purple light that shot off of her like arrows. Yo, get back here! You interrupted my wasting time and to a lesser extent blew up my living room! The woman rubbed her eyes and shook her head. She dusted off the excess powder and shards off her couch and flopped onto it like a wet sock plugging in her earphones and staring out at the woods through what used to be her sliding glass door. Or what used to be her wall, it was pretty hard to tell at that point. God, it's too late for stuff like this to be happening. Natalie barely squeezed out from the fence stokes. Towering up in front of her stood the same house. The statue looked down at her, holding its hand out as if to grab her by the head and toss her aside. There were no doubts anymore this was the house she was dead set on claiming. But it was a jarring roadblock that somebody had the guts to live there anymore. Natalie scurried around the abandoned concrete of Riverside Road, desperate to find a place to save herself. Houses and buildings lined the road as far as the eye can see, but there was no telling if any of them were actually occupied or not. Frankly, that was the one thing Natalie was not going to find out. There was simply too much of a risk for her to go around to each building, knock on the door, and keep playing Russian roulette until she could find a building she could confidently tell was safe and secure. Oh crap! I'm out in the open and defenseless! Someone's gonna find me out! I need Riley! <laughs> Come on, telephone, telephone! Oh, <laughs> perfect! Plain wood complimentary payphone. Yes. We are aware of the irony of this statement, but it was too late to change the name. Why would they print that whole thing? Oh, whatever, it doesn't matter. Hey, hey! Welcome to Plainwood Complimentary Payphone. Guaranteed that signal reaches anywhere, even more anywhere than what other lackluster services may provide you. Please press a number to get- Come on, Riley! Pick up, pick up, pick up, pick up, pick up, pick up! It sounds like you were trying to call the outside world. If you are serious and have reflected on the ungodly life choices that have brought you- uh, <laughs> Come on! Please continue and press 1. If not, please hang up and jump off the mountain. Yo! Natalie! What's up? You finally made it? I mean, I, I mean, yeah, but no, but I, 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 thought, I thought you said the house was vacant. It isn't? Y y yes, no, I, 
I mean, there's there's some woman already living there. Well, crap. That's a huge oversight. Hang on. Let me do some quick tech stuff with Fred, and I'll get back to you. new people could have hold music on their personal phone. And I'm back! So, apparently someone swiped 249 from under us last minute. Eileen Pritchett is her name. Damn it! All this work for... Pritchett? Wait, that's... That's... That's her then, right? That actually worked out great! Oh yeah, look at that! Sounds like you're luckier than you think. Wait, so if you intruded her house, does that mean that you already got to meet her? Uh, in a way. I think she wants to skin me alive, though. You worry too much, Nat. Skinning people alive hasn't been legal there since 1999. You're fine. Ugh, just barely, though. My gloves are ripped, my scars are itching, that statue's groping my soul. I freaking hate everything right now. All right, breathe, Nat. It'll be fine. You're going to find Pritchett, get in that house, and everything will be, well, not normal, but okay. <sighs> Easier said than done. I'm not breaking and entering again. I need to get her to actually invite me in. And I can't even call my best friend in a dire emergency without wondering if I'm secretly burdening her. Nat. You have never been a burden on me. Yes, but you have, Fred. Stop eavesdropping. It'll be fine, Nat. Think of how far you've gotten already. You are in Plainwood. You are literally standing next to the hand statue. This is the place your brethren have ransacked time and time again with a ruthless taste for Dexter blood. Getting in a house should be nothing for you. Yeah, but what do I do until then? Just find somewhere to crash for the time being. How many packs of ramen you got? Ten. Oh yeah, you're fine then. That should last you at least three days. Are you suggesting I eat ramen for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And dessert one time if you ever get the munchies. Ugh. I'll just find someone to mooch off of for now. Never failed Fred. So, is that it? Because you're out of our hands now. Pun intended. God, that's one thing I'm not gonna miss. Come on, I know you're smiling. I don't want to. Hiding behind jokes and sarcasms may be one of my favorite defense mechanisms of hiding behind your true feelings, only second to wearing a black, opaque, full-body, skin-tight suit so nobody can read any expressions that you're making. It's hard to describe the emotion you feel when you're snickering along to a stupid pun despite the angst and apprehension that you may otherwise be feeling. So I'm going to coin a new term for it that I'm going to call... Splankfulness. And sometimes being splankful is just what we need to get through times of uncertainty. But hey, whether you're in Plainwood or Pittsburgh, it's sure better than this hellhole. And you're sure you're fine on your own? Seems risky. I can't have anyone look after me. That'd be even riskier. Touché. So, I guess this is our last goodbye now. Yeah. I'll be thinking about you every day. You're fine, Nat. Just be sure to... Crap. Am I hearing static on your end? Bye, Riley. Natalie, wait! It sounds like you just blew up a phone. Dude. Please hang up and try again. <sighs> Natalie passed out on the ground, depleted of every bit of charge that gave her the bare minimum capacity for energy. There is no use trying to look for somewhere to crash for the night. The possibility of being spotted, mixed with the fear of having another encounter, put a paralyzing pressure on her that weighed on her back so much that she had no choice but to collapse on the ground. She lay on the concrete, relieved of the lack of anything in her pockets anymore. That black rock she had been carrying, far from just being her trusty door-shattering rock, it was finally gone. Where it was, she didn't know, and she definitely didn't care. She hated holding onto it, but she had no other choice until she finally got to Plainwood. 
even dropping the smallest bit of evidence from her past in any other patch of land would have been too risky. But finally, after 20-something years, it was gone, and she could at last live without the heavy burden of that scarlet letter. It should have felt good, but it was just as stressful as the place she had escaped. It was late o'clock, and all she wanted to do was end this night so she could finally turn to the next chapter of her life, of her mission. It was hard for her body to tell her mind to shut off and her mind to tell her body to calm down, but maybe once she got some shut-eye, all those worries would flow away like a river into a depressing trash can. But there still came that scab of worry in the back of her mind. The same scab that I was having, telling her that everything was inevitably going to crash and collapse onto her soon enough. It was a good sleep, but she didn't enjoy it. Natalie Oriole got up at the crack of dawn and stepped onto a crack of sidewalk. She had the emotional and physical consistency of a wet sock. It felt like she was covered in slime and she wasted all her energy from her encounter last night. The hope was she would stop dwelling on her house mixed up from last night, but her thoughts kept living rent-free in her head. A few deep breaths in and out and she regained her cool. She was still tired, but the new time zone was the least of her worries when it came to adjusting to Plainwood. God, they'll be talking about the... No. Everything will be fine. One mishap. One small mishap is nothing. No one's going to be talking about me unless I make a reputation of myself. Everything will be... Everything's going to be good. <laughs> the sun's rays gave Nat a bright boost in confidence and emotion. Riverside Road was the largest region in Plainwood, spanning from one end of Mount Monolay to the other. Two lookout decks stood at the end of each side of the straight, linear, cobblestone-paved street, with dense collections of buildings and trees everywhere in between. It was a beautiful, picturesque place and even appeared in Plainwood's brochure for top 10 spots in Plainwood to visit if you want the rest of your life to crumble into a never-ending spiral of chaos and sadness. Because despite the beauty and picturesquity, Riverside Road had been the main hub for hideous encounters in Plainwood since its founding, thanks to the hand statue and the house that it sat on. The white demon, the body thief, and dare I even mention the zombie puppeteer, all had their horrific starts here. It was a miracle Matt Cannon hasn't shut the place down already. Only the bravest, most extreme, or most apathetic would even dare set foot on it. Which totaled about 7 out of 1200. Everyone who did live on Riverside Road had their own reasons, whether it be to prove a point, protect the town from encounters, or most likely just show how stubborn they could be. Still, growing up on Riverside Road took a total toll on people's social being with people ability, given its, for lack of a better word, reputation of avoidance and isolation. Riversider Don Fay claims everyone here is just a little bit standoffish. Riversider Eileen Pritchard uses a much more accurate description of everyone here is a total jerk nut. Uh huh. Yeah? No! No, I am currently talking to you on the phone. Walking and pacing around the entrance to the Everwood Cafe and in on Riverside Road. Yeah, I lost my sledgehammer, so I have to make do with the torch right now. Oh yeah, fire can't burn through a 13-foot statue? Try me! I once cut down a tree with nothing but a woodpecker beak. It's called persistence. Look it up. Uh, hello. D do you live around here? Uh, hello? I'm gonna have to call you back. The hell does that mean? Hello. What is that? A new type of dessert? Halibut flavored jello? Ugh, sounds disgusting. You have a disgusting taste in food. Unless that's a new slang term. Oh, I see. You're telling me off. Is that it? Well, hey, hello to you too. I. I was just greeting you? Greeting me? I don't know you. Are you lost? Um, no. Uh, I moved here. You moved here? Out of your own volition? Yes. No one is, uh, forcing you? No. And you're sure you're not lost? This is Plainwood. That's the statue. I know where I am. Okay. What do you want? Nobody? No, no, no. Nobody just stumbles upon this place. What ulterior motives do you have here? I don't know what you're talking about. I just want to find a place to eat. Is that all? Well, if that was it, you came to the right place. Don't mind the torch. I just carry this on me for comfort. 
Uh, welcome to Playing With Stranger. We didn't properly introduce ourselves. I'm Kyle Ling, head caterer at the Snowstone Lodge. Not to brag. Pleasure to meet a new face. I love your outfit, by the way. It's a very fresh out of the bramble bush chic. All the rage for kids my daughter's age. Thanks, maybe. Kyle? Nice to meet you. I'm Natalie. Back where Natalie lived, it was customary to greet people with a casual shake. They would wave their hands to each other on the street and even slap each other's hands if they did a good job. We Plainwooders, on the other hand, had a much greater aversion to manual gestures. I still find myself instinctively ducking when a non-Plainwooder offers me a, quote, fist bump. Natalie, of course, instinctively held out her arm, expecting Kyle to return the gesture. Maybe. There was a small chance, but a chance nonetheless. If Natalie used her fully gloved right hand, Kyle would have made an exception for the crude gestures, just a little bit of culture shock. But not only did Natalie make the cultural faux pas of using her left hand of all things, her gloves disheveled from the woods grew thinner and more worn, revealing her bare palm with a deep, sensitive scar cut in the center. What the hell? Stay away from me! Oh, come on. Not you too. Uh, I didn't freaking do anything. God damn it. Does this place know about me already? Suddenly, there is much less of a need for something to eat now. Natalie released an ah, and flopped next to, but not onto, the nearest bench. The more she thought about her last two encounters, the more a tingly, stingly sensation traveled throughout her nerves. A spark spiked in her body, and she stood right back up, in desperate search for a place for some quick privacy. Fortunately, the well-kept front yard of the other building showed her an overt sign of hospitality. Evero Cafe and Inn, where comfort is our number one priority. This is Clear of our director, brought to you by Signs of Hospitality, LLD. Quick to avoid any other ennui for the morning, Natalie dashed straight into the bathroom for a moment of serene sanctuary. Crass as it may sound, Natalie's favorite place to be, especially in times of stress, was the bathroom. It was the one place that guaranteed she could be herself without even the nosiest person caring what was happening inside. She came out with her appetite regained and her morale ready for her third encounter of the day. Third time's always the charm. <sighs> hey, hey. Beautiful day, huh? It, it would be. What you riding? Cher Riley, ta er moira. Que je part. Tu remon, me hai es je hai tu remon. Hmm? Oh, oh, sorry, nothing. Plainwood was a small town, about the size of Monaco and about the population of a modestly priced cruise ship in the middle of a pandemic. There comes a point in a Plainwooder's life where if you haven't already gotten to know everyone in the village, they would at least recognize them enough to nod their head in passing or mentally flip them off whenever they hear their name. Since Plainwood was located on a secluded mountain in the middle of Canada and the States, few people felt the need to leave or enter, so whether you grew up with people you loved or hated, you were pretty much stuck with them for the rest of your life it became unsurprisingly easy for the local to spot the out-of-towner. How they expressed themselves at the sight of one varied from person to person. Don Fay preferred to keep that surprise to themselves. Need a bit of a pick-me-up this morning? Hmm? Oh, me? Uh, sure. Do you have any decaf? What does that mean? Um, do you have anything without caffeine? Never heard of that before. My wife tells me we've got chlorine in our tap water, if that's what you mean. I don't think that's right. <sighs> Can I just have, uh... Oh, banana nut muffin, then. Sure thing. One nut to do about muffin? Coming up! Dawn hopped over the counter, landing halfway onto the seat next to Natalie. Natalie hopped one seat away. So, where are you from? Huh? Where am I from? Uh... What do you mean? Well, I've never seen you before, and you greeted me by raising your hand and shaking it in the air. I assume that meant you're new here. Crap. Oh, that, that means I stick out like a sore tongue, don't I? No, 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 no. I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> you're just like everyone else here. How much for the muffin? For you, on the house this time. Don't underestimate me! Natalie jumped from the stool and bolted to the other corner of the lobby throwing a wad of a hundred dollars in singles at dawn. She sat poking herself with a fork, hoping everything was just some sort of dream. Dawn and Natalie turned their heads to face the woman at the doorway in the Easter egg-colored jogging getup. 
She carried just the right amount of optimism and extroversion to bother only the most stoic of people. Whew! Hey, hey, Dawn! How's it going? Have you looked at our flag lately? Like, what is the symbolism behind it? I... Oh my god, she looks so sad and alone! Who is she? Oh, I didn't catch their name. Judging by the green portraits of white people they drew at me, I think they're from the States. Are you seriousing me? We've got another American? <laughs> oh, this is awesome! I'm going to go over and introduce myself. I don't think that's a good idea. They seem a bit standoffish right now. Aw, uh, no worries. I'm great with people. Hey, hey, how's it going? I'm, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine. Ah, well, sometimes that's all you can ask for, right? <laughs> so, I heard you just moved here, is that right? Yeah. I'm, um, I'm from, I'm from the U.S. No way, me too! Look at that, we've already got something in common. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. Personalities are like puns. They're only natural, you should never apologize for them, and you never know what kind of reaction you're going to get from them. The owner of the statue house that Natalie intruded didn't even say two words to her before Natalie developed an irrational fear of her voice. Kyle wouldn't even let Natalie say two words to him before he ran away screaming and dived into a bush. Dawn didn't even do anything before sending Natalie into an overreactive state of frazzlement. Morgan Bailey's approach was just as, if not more, excited and intrigued as everyone else. But there was a certain charm about her that Natalie couldn't resist. Maybe it was her serene azure getup? Maybe it was her genuinely bubbly personality? Maybe it was her delightfully nostalgic banana scent she was wearing? Whatever the case, all the excited nerves within Natalie felt calm and dormant around this woman. Something about it seemed too good to be true. How could she have had nothing but bad experiences in this town so far but somehow stumble upon the warmest, comfiest person? This had to be going somewhere. The best thing to do would just be play along. So, you're new here too then? Me? <laughs> nah, I've been here for like, uh, seven years now. Pretty weird place of the places I've been, but it's home, right? Pulling her gloves on tighter, Natalie nodded and smirked with a noise that only could have meant, Home, yeah, that is totally definitely a concept I associate with good feelings. She swallowed and all she mustered was, hmm, That's good. I mean, I sort of knew what I was getting into, but... It's definitely going to take some time to get used to. Ah, see? You got the upper hand. <laughs> I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I was just plopped into this place. Like, hi, nice to meet you. I'm Morgan. Hi, Morgan. I have a demon in my brain giving me an insatiable desire to kill. And I'm like, that's cool. I'm just here to buy some extension cords. Natalie kept on her uncertain smirk. She pulled on her gloves even tighter. What I'm saying is, it'll take a while to adjust. I wasn't the, uh, best person before I came here. I finally moved. I was super scared, super stressed. Heck, I didn't even learn I was flipping people off when I waved at them until I met Matt Kennett. I was down on my luck, spending every day hoping my time to shine would eventually just happen. And you know what happened? You learned that things never just happen unless you bring them onto yourself? Nope, it just happened! And now look at me! I'm living on my own. I'm teaching social skills to teens. I've got the best friends I can ever ask for. And all that is gonna happen to you. I know it. Damn, this woman is so bright and she really actually needs sunscreen. Hey, maybe she can rub that in too. That actually helps a lot. I was really worried about starting a new life here. I've already made such a bad first impression with everyone here. Oh, first impressions are like seagulls. They're hard to get rid of and keep attacking you when you have something you want to enjoy? They're full of crap! No need to worry about what anyone thinks about you. Just do what I do and go with the flow. Do like a Roman and you'll fit in like that. Oh, and speaking of, me and my friends usually crash here after work for the evening. You're welcome to join us if you want. Or if you want to keep unpacking at your own place, perfectly fine too. <laughs> That's so nice of you. I actually... My own home. Crap. This is a hotel, right? 
I, I think I think I'm actually gonna check in here. <laughs> oh, dude, you can be my roomie. Okay, that escalated quickly. No escalators here, just stairs. <laughs> you probably shouldn't be living with me, though, if you knew me. No trouble at all, honest. I spent three years rooming with this 40-year-old stubbled homeless guy. You're like the exact opposite of that. I... It's the least I can do to help you get used to everything here. Right, but... What the hell are you doing, Natalie? This is why you came here. You either get free housing with the one person who doesn't hate you, or you get to sleep underneath a bench again. I... I... I wouldn't be a burden, would I? Not at all! I've always wanted a bestie! Cause between you and me, all the other girls here are a... <laughs> bit of a bummer, you know? How much do I owe you? Don't even talk about that! I can haggle with Dawn. Not a big deal at all. Damn it, I hate and love this woman. <laughs> that is so generous of you. Thank you so much. Hey, no problem. That's English for no eye problema. Cher Riley, ta hai moya. Tout va bien maintenant. C'est déjà mieux que le SRA. Oh my god! You write with your left hand? Yes? All right. I'm not gonna report you, but just be careful with that. It doesn't matter to me, it just may matter more to other people, you know? I, I, I completely understand. Okay, so I'm sweaty and disgusting. I'm gonna go up to my room to shower and get everything ready for you, and then head to work. And then not come back here until I get back from work. <laughs> Meantime, you can shoot the breeze with Dawn. They're the nicest person you'll ever meet. All right, take care. I'm, uh, sorry for yelling at you? Don't worry about that at all. Happens to me all the time, by the same person. I get used to it. Morgan is right, though. Um... About what? Doing it like a Roman. Trust me, this is the one place you don't want to stand out. If you know what's good for you. One other muffin, the second one's free! Why would the second one be free? A slender, towering woman with flowing auburn hair and an unremarkable grey tea approached the threshold. Unlike Morgan, she did not bring a sunny vibe to her, nor did she bring a stormy or gloomy one. At most, she brought a quick gust of vibe that would blow into your jacket and soon be forgotten like all of the other gusts that passed through. Ah, morning, Eileen. Morning, my love. What can I get for you today? Ah, gee, I'm thinking of mixing it up this time. Let's see, you can get me. As Eileen scanned the menu and thought, she locked eyes with Natalie in her unmistakable disheveled appearance. Get the hell out of here as fast as you can. Nat Aberdeen's Sinister Recluse is a production of Adam Devois, written and produced by Adam Devois. The voice of Natalie is Nell. The voice of Eileen is Summer Rose. The voice of Riley is Jasmine Williams. The voice of Kyle is Tarozu. The voice of Dawn is Firus DR. The voice of Morgan is Anna Kate Hindman. The voice of Nat Aberdeen and the telephone operator is Adam Devois. The theme music is Night Witch by Cloud System. All other sound effects used are found on Toon Tank and Free Sound. More information can be found in the video description. This episode is brought to you by the Everoak Cafe and Inn on Riverside Road in Plainwood. Now serving all kinds of obscurely named dishes, such as the Nuts to Do About Muffin, the Paint Burger, and the new Clogger. Stop by the Everoak today. Do not drink the tap water. <laughs>